it unmutes me and then I can just simply let up and I'm back to muted again. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Peters. Yeah, I just tried this. I just tried this Facebook. Uh, I mean, that uh, space bar deal, and it works. It's pretty neat. <laughs> yes, yes, that is an easy way to do it. Um, I'm looking for uh, Ms. Catalina Chacon, our F dot presenter. Can I get a sound check from you? I see Good that morning. you're on. Good, Good morning. morning, Ms. Catalina. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for joining us. All right, thank you for having me. All right. We will be getting to your presentation a little bit later. We have it, we have it loaded up and ready to go. Okay, so uh, Madam Chairwoman, it is 9.30 by all my clocks and we are recording um, live streaming to YouTube and um, we are ready to begin the meeting when you are ready to begin the meeting. All right, sounds like we are ready. So welcome everyone to this final virtual Metro Plan Orlando CAC meeting of this year. I'd like to call the meeting to order. My name is Sarah Albadri and I'll be chairing the meeting today. We also have a team of folks working to ensure this meeting runs smoothly. Thank you to all of them always. Today's meeting was advertised on Metro Plan Orlando's website and social media, as well as through targeted emails. Florida Sunshine Law requires a quorum be physically present in a room for a government meeting. Governor DeSantis suspended this requirement in an executive order, which has since expired. This meeting is being held in workshop format to conform with Sunshine requirements. Our next meeting will be held in person and staff will share more information about that in a few minutes. Now time for our Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I'll ask our Vice Chair to lead us in the pledge. Everyone please remain on mute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Today's meeting will keep microphones muted unless you've been recognized to speak. And we'll use the raise hands feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to participate in the discussion. There are two public comment points in this meeting. Mem members of the public who wish to speak um, will, sorry folks, um, who wish to speak. Sorry. Uh, members of the public who wish to speak um, will use the raise hands feature on the Zoom screen. If attending by phone, you'll hit star nine to raise your hand and request to be recognized. When you're called, your microphone will be temporarily unmuted by staff and will ask you to state your name and contact information for the record. We also accepted comments by email and phone message before the meeting. We want online meetings to be accessible to all. Participants may join by computer, tablet, or phone. If you need accommodations to participate in the future, please contact MetroPlan Orlando. All right, at the June 9th Metro Plan Orlando board meeting, we learned that the board's $100,000 request for best foot forward um, was approved by the legislature. However, it was vetoed by the, from the budget by Governor DeSantis. Also at the last board meeting, FDOT provided more details on their newly developed District 5 Safety Office, which plans to concentrate on better coordination of existing safety effort, efforts, um, especially on influencing behavior changes. They also discuss efforts to get projects ready so the district can take better advantage of funds coming um, from the stimulus incentives, um, initiatives, sorry. I filled the board members in on our Brightline discussion in May. Um, and uh, that was, oh, special note. I wanna welcome Ms. Cheryl Stone to the CAC, one of our new members representing the trans, uh, members representing the transportation disadvantage decided that she cannot continue. The CAC selection committee had already identified Ms. Stone as an alternative to step into that role. So we're delighted that she can now join us officially. The Metro Plan Orlando board approved her appointment at the last meeting. So Ms. Stone, would you like to say a few words and introduce yourself briefly? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very, very happy to be um, a part of this committee and group and meet some new people. Um, I have been involved with transportation issues for over 20 years. I'm a retired um, clinical laboratory scientist. My specialty was microbiology, and I also use a wheelchair 
because I had polio as a child. Um, I've always driven myself since I was a teenager, had a car, went wherever I want until I had some sh shoulder surgery back in the late 90s and had to use paratransit. Um, it was a miserable failure for me. Um, I was constantly late to work, et cetera, et cetera. We've all heard the stories and um, I got involved. And here I am still um, 20 years later being involved in transportation issues for people with um, issues like mine, disabilities are even economically disadvantaged. Um, I've been very happy over the last 20 years or so to serve in a variety of roles from state commissioner uh, for the Florida Commission for um, the Transportation Disadvantaged and also local roles on the local coordinating board with Metro Plan, working with SunRail when they did their startup, I'm on the board for the Center for Independent Living, um, lots of different hats that I've worn and do wear um, th throughout my career of advocacy and um, education for uh, the need for safe and reliable, uh, cost-effective and flexible transportation for persons like myself when we can't drive or never have driven and um, making awareness out there for people that just because we have a disability, we just go to doctors. We go to the grocery store. We go on picnics. We go to movies. Um, I always say that we go to happy hour, just like everyone else. So we need transportation to get there and back. So thank you for um, inviting me to be a member of this group. And I look forward to uh, working with you on transportation issues now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Stone. We really appreciate you sharing uh, your personal story and bringing your advocacy to this board. Uh, we look forward to your participation. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize Mary Ann Horn of Metro Plan Orlando for our agenda review. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman El uh, committee members, all those attending online. Um, thank you for working with us as we've conducted these virtual meetings. We appreciate your patience and your understanding. And now we will move into another transition, going back to in-person meetings at our office at 250 South Orange Avenue in downtown Orlando. I wanna spend just a few minutes giving you an idea of what to expect at our first in-person CAC meeting, which will be on August 25th, because we do not meet in July. As you know, we have not had to have a quorum for these virtual workshops because we have not officially voted. However, when we resume in-person meetings, we will need a quorum of at least, uh, at this point, 16 members in the room to conduct votes. Um, this will also make it very important to RSVP for our meetings so that we know if we are in danger of not having a quorum and can prepare for that. Also, um, as we have not been taking action at our virtual workshops, we will need to ratify board actions taken during that time, which is really just simply acknowledging that action for the record. And we will have to officially approve our own minutes of all the workshops during the time that, um, that we were having those. Our board services team has been keeping careful track of this. So you will see two fairly straightforward items on the August agenda to clear up that business. Um, when we begin to meet again in person, there will uh, still be a Zoom option available for the public. They can see the meeting online. They will be able to offer public comments. We have found that participation from the public increased uh, with our virtual meetings, and that's a plus. Uh, so we will encourage the public to, to stay virtual as we work through our, at least our first few in-person meetings. However, again, board and committee members need to attend in person to be counted present and to be part of our quorum. Um, when we meet in person, we will be observing the CDC guidelines. Uh, we will ask any unvaccinated members to wear masks during the meeting. Uh, vaccinated members may dispense with masks if they feel comfortable doing so. We'll ask that everyone be considerate of each other and, and particularly that you let me know if you have particular concerns, because I want to hear about that. Um, a couple of things will be different. For one, um, our little continental breakfast uh, that we used to offer are on hold for now. We'll have water and coffee available. Um, 
for you. Uh, we have new audio visual equipment in the boardroom, which will give us better quality meetings. Uh, it has some great electronic features. The Metro Plan Orlando board and the TDLCB have been using it and they give it good reviews. Uh, so we'll allow a little time at the beginning of the August meeting for a tutorial on how to use the equipment and you'll all be experts by the time we adjourn. Uh, we held our TIP public meeting on Monday <clears throat> and we set a record for attendance. Uh, several of you attended and we appreciate that. You will hear from Keith later in the agenda for more about the TIP in our public meeting. After this meeting, I will send um, out some information and including a link to that video in case you did not see the meeting and want to, to see how that was presented to the public. Um, now we would like to take attendance and uh, Ms. Kathy Goldfarb will call the roll, please. I'll ask all committee members to please go ahead and unmute yourselves now for the roll call, and you can go on mute again after your name is called. Please make sure your video is on if possible so we can confirm it's you. You'll find the unmute and video buttons on your Zoom screen. Please say here or present when your name is called. Campbell? Present. Sid? Cortez? Council? Davis, Present. Present. Davis, Dias, Eisenberg, El Badri, Henley, Present. Henry, Present. Lassard, Liz Swain, Liz Swain, Mormon, Mormon, Mott, present, Bueller, present, O'Hanlon, O'Hanlon, Peters, present, Pigram, present. Rump? Yes, present. Salas? Here. Shaw? Sabila? Present. Stevens? Present. Stone? Present. Torialba? Present. Webster? Present. White? Present. That concludes the roll call. Um, sorry, we just got a note in the chat. Um, I think Tom might be in the attendee side of things. If he could be moved over, um, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, we will now hear public comments on what we normally call action items, but in this format, we will, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, on what we normally call action items, but this format we will be, will be items for review and or discussion. Um, do we have any folks who want to speak on these items? If so, please use the raise hands function on your screen or press star nine on your phone keypad. We will call your name. The host will unmute your microphone. You will see the button pop up um, that says the host would like to unmute you. Please accept that prompt. We ask that you provide your name and address for the record. Please hold your comments to less than two minutes. Are there any comments at this time? Madam Chairwoman, I do not see any hands raised um, on the public side of our meeting. Um, and we did not receive any, any written or telephone comments pertaining to this meeting. Wonderful, thank you so much, Marianne. All right, we're gonna move on to our items for review um, and discussion. We have five items today. Our first item is gonna be review of the minutes from our May 26th meeting, which are in tab one of your agenda packets. I hope you all had a chance to read them. Um, if there are any corrections or revisions for consideration, please bring them to our attention now. All right, um, you can either do that by hands raised or um, just share them. I'm not seeing any hands raised, so we're gonna move forward. Perfect. 
Um, as a reminder, um, as Marianne said, we're going to bring back um, our minutes for formal approval, uh, formal approval at our August 25th meeting, which will be in person. We're going to move on to our next item, which is an emergency Florida Department of Transportation amendment um, to the FY. So the fiscal year 2020, 2021 through 2024, 2025 transportation improvement program found in tab two of your agendas. Mr. Keith Kasky, um, the floor is yours when you are ready. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, uh, committee members. Uh, this amendment request came up in late May after this committee and most of our other committees had already met. And this had to be amended into the state TIP by a June 10th deadline. So FDOT requested uh, that this amendment be processed on an emergency basis. So our board chairwoman uh, signed the resolution approving this amendment request on May 27th. Uh, based on Metro Plan's policy for processing emergency TIP amendments. And uh, this request includes uh, moving part of the construction funding for the Cross Seminole Trail Connector project from the existing project number to a new project number. So the city of Longwood can provide staff services for the project under a, a LAP agreement. And then the other project involves adding uh, FTA grant funds and local matching funds for links to purchase six new electric buses for the limo system. And uh, you all have the information on this in tab two in your packets. And uh, the board will be requested to ratify the signed resolution at their July 7th meeting. So uh, with that, are there any questions on this? Um, you can raise your hands function or um, ask your question. Keith, I just wanted to say thank you um, to you and MetroPlan staff for providing all the backup documentation within our packets um, to kind of explain what the emergency was, why there needed to be um, this request of this kind, um, and just to meet the state's TIP um, amendment process. So thank you for that. I'm not seeing any hands raised from any of the committee members, so I think we can move forward with our next item. Thank you so much. All uh, right, so um, we're going to move to the uh, fiscal year 2021, 2022 through 2025, 2026 transportation improvement program found in tab three of our agendas. Mr. Keith Kasky will continue with this uh, item. Um, the floor is yours, Keith. Okay, well, I gave you all a preview of the new TIP last month, and there is a link on, on your agenda where you can uh, uh, review the draft TIP. And then there's some additional uh, information in uh, tab three. And as Mary Ann mentioned, uh, we had our uh, virtual TIP public meeting uh, this past Monday and had very good attendance. We were pleased with that. And this slide shows a comparison of the attendance we had at our TIP public meeting this year compared with last year. And last year we had 51 public attendees and the total attendance of 74, including all the panelists. And this year we had 80 uh, public attendees with a total attendance of 105. And as Mary Ann said, that sets a record, uh, particularly for the uh, TIP. And uh, so we were very pleased with the turnout. And uh, the, uh, if I can get to the next slide here, we had uh, a good number of questions and comments on a lot of different topics. And I just uh, listed some of the uh, main topics on the slide there. Uh, you know, there were questions or comments about the need to shift more funding away from major capacity highway projects to alternative transportation modes such as transit and bicycle pedestrian and complete streets and so on. And we had several uh, questions and comments about the need to expand bus and sunrail hours of service. There was uh, at least one comment and some discussion about the need for vehicle charging stations as the number of electric vehicles increases. And then there was a comment about the need for greater mobility equity for people without cars uh, and just how uh, Lynx is helping to, to meet that need. And uh, the uh, comment period uh, for the TIP public meeting expires later today. And then we'll be sending a summary of the comments out separately. And we had uh, two polling questions. Uh, the first of these was, which of these best describes your transportation personality? And there were four um, uh, items, uh, including the debater, the advocate, the logistician, and the adventurer. And uh, most people uh, saw themselves as the advocate, you know, having a vision for the perfect transportation system and then uh, working to, together to try to see, achieve that goal. And then the other uh, polling question was, where should Central Florida increase spending the most to improve our transportation system? 
and the vast majority of the people voted to uh, increase spending to improve transit connections between the bus and rail system. And then we had a, a group of uh, panelists uh, from local jurisdictions and agency helped us uh, answer questions during the meeting. And they were, we're very appreciative of, of their participation. And uh, the TIP will be going to the board uh, for approval at their July 7th meeting. So uh, with that, I will um, open it up and see if anyone has any questions. What a quiet crew today. What's going on, y'all? Um, I do want to say, um, or I, I do would like to express, uh, you know, a gratitude to the uh, Metro Plan staff for having this as a virtual meeting um, and choose to, and working to increase attendance year over year. Um, I would like to advocate potentially for a similar format as we move forward, just so more folks who aren't able to come to downtown Orlando uh, during the evening uh, to be able to continue to participate in the TIP process um, and have their comments heard um, and feel like they're participating um, live. So uh, I think that's really great. Um, and also very glad that the uh, Metro Plan Board will be hearing some of these comments at their next board meeting. Uh, Ms. Mott, you're recognized for your comments. Yes, I would like, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to extend my appreciation to Keith. You did an extraordinary job. I had an opportunity to participate in that on the user side yesterday. And I, it was very interesting to hear the, um, the public comments, some great information that they shared with us that we can take back and find a way to incorporate into what we do. And also to the Metro Plan staff. I just echo what Madam Chairwoman said as well with regards to the, uh, the, um, the great job that you did. So again, appreciation to everybody. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mott. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any additional hands raised. Um, so I guess we can move on to our next item. Thank you, Mr. Kasky. Um, so uh, we're gonna be talking about our fiscal year 2026, 2027 through 2035, 2036, woof, pro <laughs> prioritized project list, which is found in tab four of your agendas. Mr. Nick Lepp from Metroplane Orlando um, will be presenting this information. Um, Mr. Lepp, uh, when you are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, good morning. So yes, I'm here to present now our finalized uh, prioritized project list. Uh, last month I presented the preview. Uh, next slide, please. And that preview was largely based on just our performance measures and the metrics coming out to show what our priorities are to meet that performance-based planning requirement that we now have to do within our prioritized project list. Uh, this one that you have uh, seen in your packet uh, now looks at some weighting and some emphasis towards vulnerable road users, which I'll explain in a few minutes, um, that the board suggested that we incorporate within to our prioritization process. So as a reminder, uh, the prioritized project list is that bridge that gaps the long range transportation plan or now what we're calling our metropolitan transportation plan, that 25 year vision. This is the 10 year bridge that puts those projects and gets them ready to go into the transportation improvement program that you just approved with uh, Keith just right now. Uh, next slide, please. So there has to be a direct linkage of this uh, prioritized list to our cost feasible plan within the MTP. Um, it's developed to support our regional goals and objectives, and it has all of those performance measures that were tied to those. And I'll have a slide to uh, remind you of those in a minute. And then it has to be, it's also consistent with uh, Metro Plan's uh, funding policies. And, and that's tied to our TMA, urbanized area funds, those federal funds that come to us because we're a large urbanized area. We have those uh, special policies going, um, contributing towards complete streets, sidewalks and bike ped, TISMO activities, and as well as transit. Um, next slide, please. So these are the performance measures that are attached to all of those goals and objectives that we just talked about. And the performance-based planning uh, provides a ranking or a number assigned to each one of these measures. And all projects that um, either meet one of these measures or do not, it's all added up to give us a ranked score. And those ranked scores, the highest score becomes our highest priority as we move forward. And that is the performance-based planning approach that we've been, um, that we've adopted and incorporated into our priority list over the past uh, three years. Next slide, please. 
So the board and committee um, wanted to add some weighting to our priority list. When I presented last month, we were just showing you the raw numbers based on uh, the metrics from those goals uh, that I showed you in the slide earlier. Now we've applied some weighting to that, adding some emphasis to safety and security, uh, access to connectivity, investment economy, reliability and health, all in that order. So the highest weight is going to safety and security. But additionally, the board wanted to put emphasis on vulnerable road users, obviously coming after some of those dangerous by design and other safety reports that we've seen, uh, we need to start uh, putting some emphasis on uh, addressing that situation. So they have uh, requested that within those metrics that the uh, bicycle and pedestrian score actually is double. So we are double emphasis of bicycle pedestrian crash uh, locations as well as an additional emphasis on waiting for other safety and security within our network. So the priority list that you are gonna be seeing now that we're gonna be um, looking for your support will uh, have those metrics in there and have that waiting. So those uh, projects now you're gonna start seeing them shift, uh, showing some emphasis on some more complete street and other safety type projects within our long list of projects um, moving forward as priorities. Next slide, please. So just to recap on some of the programs in other areas that we have. Um, so within our priority list, there's a program to use $2 million to support TISMO activities on the national highway and state road system. We also have the new off system construction program that's looking to utilize some of those other federal funds uh, for off system major construction could be widenings, but also could support some of those pedestrian bridges that have been log jammed on our priority list for years because of our funding policies. We also are still continuing our $1 million a year for special corridor studies and data collection, as well as adding another million dollars as a program to uh, support some safety emphasis corridors. Um, and that will start coming out in 25 and 26 as that program starts to mature. Uh, we still have our bicycle pedestrian school mobility. So 20% will go to support any safe route to school or school mobility project that didn't quite get the funding from the state. And we're also looking to pull out some of those funds to support the sidewalk gap program and fill in some of those sidewalk gaps that are smaller that don't quite rise to the level of a one solid project, but there could be an area that is in significant need of some sidewalks. And then also we still are continuing our signal retiming program through our TISMO activities, as well as our regional TISMO program and ACES demonstration. So these are all programs that are taking some of those TMA funds off of the top, but aren't really those lapped projects that we've talked about before in the past. Now, if we can go to the next slide. Now, here are some of the priority projects that we've start, that we'll start seeing come into the Transportation Improvement Program next year. Um, as Keith described, um, the whole process takes about a year to develop the TIP. As we develop these priorities, these will be that next fifth year or those next projects that we'll be hopefully entering into the TIP and presenting to you next year. So based on the weighting and what we presented last month, um, here are some of the changes that occurred by adding that emphasis to not only safety, but additionally to the bike ped um, crash criteria. So some of the projects like the 1792 and 535 actually moved up because of that criteria because of the activity that's occurring there and especially the bicycle pedestrian safety and safety emphasis with those projects up. But then some of the other projects moved down. Um, and literally, it didn't really move them down too much. We're only talking about one to three spots, but we are still adding that emphasis towards bicycle pedestrian. And we're starting to see those projects now uh, bubble up to the top of our priority list. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our new off-system construction project. This one really didn't wasn't affected by the weighting because the criteria to have these projects added is that the local government needs to demonstrate a commitment towards the planning, design, and right-of-way phase of the projects. And if that's demonstrated in part of their capital improvement program or transportation element of their plan, then they can uh, submit and go after some construction assistance funds with those federal funds. So these are the projects right now that we have that are eligible, that have been submitted by our local government partners that meet that criteria where they've committed to um, those initial phases and will be looking for some construction assistance out in the year 25, 26. Next slide, please. The TISMO and ITS projects actually didn't change that much, but looking at the list that we have, it really does support a lot of our safety corridors and areas of uh, emphasis. 
So the Pine Street and Canoe Creek are all projects that are really looking to enhance not only the, the corridor itself for reliability, but for safety. So all of those projects, except for the Huey Ave, that started, came up to the number five spot from number six, all pretty much remain the same based on that safety weighting and pedestrian emphasis. Next slide, please. And then our complete street projects. Our top projects still remained the same under that emphasis. But again, you can start seeing where some of those projects started shifting and moving. But I think all of our complete streets really support the safety and bicycle pedestrian safety, which is why we weren't seeing much movement on those. These are still our priority corridors that we know we have to go out and start addressing for those components. Uh, next slide, please. And then our bicycle pedestrian improvements. Um, Still our top priorities for our regional trails with the Little Econ uh, and Shingle Creek moving forward. There Again, this wasn't much change because these are mostly off systems. So as we're talking about bicycle and pedestrian safety in a lot of our hotspots, those are on our roadways, but these are our rankings based on the other performance measures um, for that regional trail improvements and uh, our priorities. Next slide, please. And then our updated transit capital projects. Um, number one is really links capital expenses and transit asset management, making sure they can maintain the buses that we have in the system. With SunRail phase three, that connection to the airport is our number one uh, premium transit project. But then three and four are really necessary as priorities for links to expand their system and really start um, adding those additional routes that we have been uh, trying to push forward with. Uh, next slide, please. So that is our kind of updated priority list based on the weighting and pedestrian emphasis. Uh, the next steps will be, we'll be taking this to the board for adoption and then ultimately submitting that priority list for the national highway and state roads for the department, as well as our TMA programming list that uh, supports our policies of complete streets, uh, sidewalks, TISMO activities and transit. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions about our final priority prioritized project list. Mr. Sabia, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, and this is this is an amazing list and, and the priorities. And so I can see how difficult it is to figure out the priorities because there's so many important projects. Uh, my question is, I, uh, and I apologize for if I am just now realizing this and I haven't brought this up before, uh, but on these priorities, how much is being dedicated, if anything, to educating the community, uh, marketing and communicating uh, safety, uh, best be best practices and behaviors uh, as, as part of these uh, infrastructure projects, how much of uh, marketing, communicating uh, the purpose of these projects to the communities is also included? Well, uh, great question. So the public engagement really starts through our metropolitan transportation plan process as we are identifying these as needs um, and then really prioritizing them through that cost feasible process. Uh, once the projects start getting going, uh, the first initial phase, kind of that planning or PD&E phase, a lot of public engagement that is needed to either support or not support the project. So that's where we start getting that public engagement component. But as you were talking about the marketing for safety, that's largely covered in our overall organizational budget, our UPWP, where we're looking at activities for staff as tasks to try to not only um, implement projects for transportation and funding. But then, like you said, we're, we're starting some marketing and safety campaigns uh, to educate at the same time um, on some of our transportation activities and issues that we have in the region. So awesome. we should start Thank seeing, you. yeah, we should start seeing some of those uh, coming out um, kind of in the next couple months. We have some, um, we just completed our tracking the trends report, which showed some kind of um, changes over the transportation system over the last year. And with that, we'll start be pushing out some of those aha information items of what's kind of going on with our system, which will also help hopefully educate. That's terrific, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Pigdrum, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, good morning, Nick. Um, phenomenal job as always. And as a numbers guy, I'm always, uh, I always appreciate with the number of needs that our region has more objective measuring. <laughs> so excited to see the ratings and, and definitely interesting to see what moved and certainly what didn't move. And I think that does a lot about metro plan and kind of where our mindset has been that along with a, a lot of those rating changes that there actually were no changes. So 
Uh, but wanted to ask real quick on the links north and south operating um, bases that you talked about or the uh, operation centers. How like turnkey are those? Are they at a point where land's been identified and it's look, we just we need federal funding, we can make this happen quick? Or what what is already been done with those, and where are they at in the planning process? If you have any insight, uh, currently Lynx is exploring the the right of way um, purchase for the southern operation base in Osceola. I do not believe there has been any, um, except for kind of pre-planning work for the Northern operation base. So that's where we're kind of at on both of those phases. So once the right of way has been complete, we'll start seeing the programming within the, the transportation improvement program for that design and construction of the Southern operation base will obviously come in first with the right of way purchasing happening now. Uh, the Northern one, uh, we still need to work with Seminole County and links, um, not only on a site, but just on the timing of that. Thank you, Mr. O'Hanlon. You're still muted, Mr. O'Hanlon. Sorry. Hey, Nick. Um, sorry about that. Oh, morning. Morning. Road 434 project in Oviedo took the biggest hit uh, going down three positions. And I know that with COVID this past year, that that road has become much safer because lot less people are driving on it, but starting in September, that's gonna be a disaster again, and it's a phenomenal safety hazard. So I'm surprised that it went down in the ratings. Why? It, it, it's funny, it went down in the ratings because there wasn't a lot of pedestrian um, crash activity that's occurred on it, um, largely because people don't wanna walk on it because they're on any sidewalks anyway. Yeah. Uh, but the actual project itself, uh, what I didn't explain is these were the, the mathematical rankings coming out. But our priority list, the way it is implemented, any project that has already started, so for example, that 434 is an excellent example, design is underway. We wanna make sure that our projects are completed before we start entering in new phases and new projects. So the 434 project, though it went down, it went down because it went from our TMA funded complete street list back over to the state funded list. So where it fell was just kind of based on mathematical ranking, but it will still be a top priority to finish before that next new phase on the state roadways start coming into our transportation improvement program. Okay, thanks for the update. Yep. Welcome. Thank you, Ms. Murphy, you're recognized. Thank you very much. Great presentation, Nick, thank you very much. Um, as I said then, wait, I sort of sort my went through the process in my mind of, of the answer to my question. But Nick, I mean, David had asked earlier about the marketing and educating, education the community about the area. And I was specifically thinking about the Barack Obama Parkway being extended from Metro to Raleigh Street. And I was concerned because I grew up in that area and I, I don't live in there, but the family still have property over there. And someone has been educated because I get phone calls all the time to sell that property. And uh, my concern is that uh, family members that are still there is selling property, not knowing what's going on, what the future is going to look like in a couple of years. But as I thought about that, that's the city commissioner job to educate that community as to what's going on. So I would address that concern with them. But I do want to ask the, uh, uh, the question is, once that phase two is completed uh, from uh, Metro to Raleigh Street, is that there I've been hearing talk that it'll be another phase from Raleigh to Pine Hills Road. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. There is another phase that will connect it all the way north to close to Old Winter Garden, if I remember correctly. Um, so it will be a, a parallel connection uh, to Kirkman Road um, and hopefully a much safer pedestrian oriented connection uh, parallel to Kirkman Road. So I guess I'm, I'm, I, I can see, I visualize, because I know how the connection is gonna work from Metro to Raleigh, because I, I see the construction going on, clearing those woods, but I, I cannot visualize how it's gonna pick up from Raleigh to uh, Old Winnegun Road. I guess that's another uh, discussion, so yeah. We, I can, uh, we can set something up with the city 
Um, I'm sure they have some preliminary plans that they were looking at, probably not into the design level of the exact alignment, but something that could probably conceptually um, help you fill in the blank there. So I could reach out to the city and, and see if we can um, get that question answered for you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. That looks like uh, that covers all of our member comments. Um, I'm not seeing any additional hands raised. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chairwoman, if I may, there, um, we had a problem with our settings um, for this meeting and we apologize for that. Um, we, have, uh, we, we have someone on the um, public side who wished to speak here, but um, I, this is not the time that we take public comments. However, we do have a time coming up later in the meeting. And so I would like to urge that person who um, was trying to speak now from the audience to um, please stay with us and, and you may speak um, during public comment and we'll tell you how at the time. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, I see that comment. All right. Uh, we thank you so much, Nick Lepp. We really appreciate your time and your presentation. We're going to move forward to our uh, next item, which is a request for volunteers for the pedestrian safety uh, working group. Uh, Mr. Mike Wilson will discuss a little bit more about this and um, bring the request to this committee. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to continue on this theme of uh, improving safety for pedestrians, and, and actually we're, we're talking about this being uh, all vulnerable users uh, as far as the, the focus on this group, so um, and not just those on foot. And um, so this grew out of uh, discussions by the Technical Advisory Committee during the uh, presentations on uh, the Dangerous by Design report. And so the recommendation from that committee was to develop a working group to look at uh, vulnerable user safety and with a specific focus really on corridor speeds. As, as you recall from my presentation uh, earlier that uh, really our operating speeds are a big component of why so many pedestrians are killed in our area every year, uh, particularly at night. Um, that's not to say that we're gonna limit it to, to speeds, but that will be a primary focus. And so what we're looking for is a group that will help us to develop the planning and program strategies to improve safety for these users. Uh, I expect that we'll probably start off on a monthly basis. We may then move it to quarterly, depending on uh, you know, how, much, how many items you know, the group uh, identifies to, to work on and uh, just to, you know, take it as it goes. Uh, Expect, you know, we would probably run the group for about a year um, to develop the, the again, the, the plans and programs that we hope to get out of this so that we can address this issue more effectively. What we're looking for from a volunteer standpoint is for each of the three main committees, we're looking for three volunteers, one from each county. So that's what my ask is this morning, like a volunteer from each from Orange, Seminole and Osceola. So Mr. Wilson, just to understand you're taking mm -hmm. nominations for uh, folks volunteering today right now. Correct. Uh, I see that Dr. Stevens and uh, Mr. David Sibilia have raised their hand. Dr. Stevens, can you remind us which county you represent? Actually, that was uh, gonna be a question of mine. I'm actually a Metroplan appointee uh, for the region, actually for, uh, um, I, so I, is it gonna be uh, representatives from a specific jurisdiction, you know, like representatives from Osceola County, from Seminole and from Orange, or is, are the appointees also um, in the pool as well or what? I'm going to clarify that. Uh, that's a good question. We had not really um, thought about um, that. If I may, Mike, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, um, on something like this, yes, we have uh, Metro plan appointees, but for the instance, when we choose officers or things like that, and we have county distributions, we go with where you live. If you are a Metro Plan uh, Orlando appointee, um, you are also a resident of one of our counties um, by definition. So that would would be your county. And, and in that case, I'm actually at Orange County. So. And Mr. Sabia, I think from what I remember of your application and your introduction that uh, when you first joined the board that you also live in Orange County. I, I do live in Orange County. I also saw that RJ Mueller had also uh, offered for Orange County, but this, um, this topic is so important to me. I'm willing to move to another county if necessary. <laughs> uh, no, but, but if you guys uh, do uh, end up selecting another 
uh, member for this committee uh, from Orange County. I'm totally fine with that, but I would still love to be involved in any way that I can because this is an important issue. So thank you. Dr. Stevens. Uh, yes, I would like to uh, point out that actually one of my offices is in uh, Kissimmee. You know, I teach from the uh, UCF Valencia campus down in Kissimmee. If that makes any difference, I can actually, I, I was an urban planner down in Osceola for nearly five years. So, uh, you know, I do have, uh, you know, considerable knowledge of that area as well. So for all it's worth. Thank you for that perspective, Dr. Stevens. So um, one thing I do wanna mention is uh, I think with the publication of Dangerous by Design uh, this year, as it is with every year, I think uh, a lot of the board really just got tired of the same results and uh, uh, especially the uh, technical advisory committee um, really wanted to push for something different. And so I think this ad hoc work working group is a, a really, good push. So I would um, encourage anybody. I am also from Orange County and I've served on a lot of these committees. I think this is really important work. Um, so I know that there's a lot of folks on Orange that have already expressed their interest, but if you live in Seminole or Osceola County, I think this is really uh, a time to jump on the momentum and, and get some work done um, so that we can actually change our, um, how we approach this problem uh, and take this more seriously with FDOT um, as, a, as a real partner in this. So, yeah. Um, Ms. Mott, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Mike, what was the time, um, time of day you're prospecting to have the meetings roughly? Like, is it morning or is it afternoon? What are you thinking or which direction are you going? We will, we will pull, pull uh, group members uh, once we get the group uh, together and, um, and I ex expect that um, we can also do, do these virtually. Um, you know, since we don't have to have real action items out of them, it's uh, more of an ad advisory uh, case. So to be determined. To be determined, okay, thank you. Mr. Wilson, I also had a question. I recently had a conversation with the City of Orlando's Vision Zero coordinator. Um, that might not be her official title, but she is working on the Vision Zero program for the city. Um, as far as I know, she's the only person with such a specific role to work on Vision Zero. Are you going to be kind of pulling in some other staff across um, Orange, Seminole, and Osceola to be discussing um, their work on dangerous by design related activities? Well, yes, we will have representatives from both the Technical Advisory Committee and, and the TISMO. So, um, so we'll have planners and engineers from, from the three counties and, and you know, cities within them as well. Um, so I ex fully expect Laura certainly to be a participant in that. She's very passionate about that. Good. So I'm still not seeing any hands raised from Seminole or Osceola. Mr. Campbell? Not knowing the exact time and the time of the investment, I, I will raise my hand now for Seminole. I mean, I'm happy to help with it. Once Thank we figure you. out exactly when we're going to do it. I appreciate that, Mr. Vice Chair. Mr. Lissa Swain. Oh, I see that hand raised, sir. All right. So again, with, with knowing until we find out the time, but I'll, I'll do the Osceola. Perfect. Ms. Council? Upon the time um, being um, told, I will also participate with Osceola. Awesome. Thanks, Ms. Council. You were breaking in and out, but I heard that you, um, uh, dependent on the time um, and your availability, that you would be interested in also serving from Osceola. So it sounds like we Absolutely. have- Absolutely. Thank you. It sounds like we have a couple volunteers, Mike. Um, Mary, do you mind coordinating with Marianne to kind of just figure out the time commitment and then just mm -hmm. finalizing which folks from which county would be available um, to serve? Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, well, folks. And then we had David, uh, Mr. David Sibula, and um, and uh, RJ yep. for, for Orange. And Mr. Stevens as well. Right. Um, yeah, Madam Chairwoman, if I may, um, I, I can put, I can read out the names that I have. And, and I would also point out that we have some members who are not here, um, although they would have seen this on the agenda, but, um, but uh, 
at any rate, from Orange, um, two people volunteered, um, Mr. Sabila and Dr. Stevens, from Seminole, um, Ms. Mr. Campbell volunteered contingent on the time being something that can work in his schedule. And the same uh, from Osceola um, with Mr. Alyssa Swain and uh, Ms. Council. And we did not hear from Mr. Mueller, but he did raise his hand. He is also an Orange County resident. Did we, did I miss anybody? Marianne, actually, I see up. comments from uh, R.J. Mueller in the uh, text. Says he's available for orange if needed, but he'll yes. retract if mm -hmm. I want to. <laughs> so, yeah. I think that covers everybody. That's, that's what I have. Well, we, let us let, let's talk it over. We're happy to have we're happy to have these volunteers. We can get more information out to you, and we can. We can maybe manage this process and report back at the next meeting. That'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. Mr. Wilson, is there anything else you um, need on this item? That is it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm really thankful to all the folks that volunteered to serve on this uh, working group. I think there's uh, really good things ahead for us. Um, thank you so much for um, agreeing to serve if you are available. All right, folks, um, we're going to move on to our presentations and status updates. We have two presentations today. Please use the raise hand function to be um, recognized. If you have a question, you may raise your hand during the presentation, but please hold your questions until the end. Um, if you're having audio issues, you can, of course, use the chat box um, to uh, relay your question and uh, someone will moderate. So our first presentation is gonna be about signal retiming. Um, it's gonna be a presentation from our very own Metro Planner Orlando, Laura Bauck. Um, Ms. Bauck, you have the floor. Good morning, committee members. Um, my name is Laura Bauck. I'm a senior transportation engineer here at Metro Plan Orlando, and I manage our annual traffic signal retiming program. And I'm here this morning to give you a brief uh, presentation on the findings from our fiscal year 2019 and 2020 signal retiming travel time and delay study. This is a study that we complete annually to assess the value of our signal retiming program where we collect before and after peak hour travel time and speed data, and we perform some benefit cost analyses. Next slide, please. So why is signal retiming? A bit of background for, in particular, for those who are new to the committee. Uh, this is the 14th consecutive year that Metro Plan Orlando has funded the retiming and coordination of traffic signals throughout our region. Each year we work with our agency partners to identify which signals in the region need to be retimed. And then new timing plans are implemented for each of the selected signals. Signal retiming is a technology solution uh, that offers us an opportunity to increase traffic flow and mitigate congestion, to account for changes in traffic patterns, to reduce delay, and also to improve air quality and safety. Um, signal retiming can also provide our municipalities with some opportunities to periodically examine intersection operations and corridor progression and identify um, related maintenance issues, particularly those with signal control equipment. So for our 2019-2020 program, that included retiming traffic signals on 30 corridors and at 17 independent intersections throughout the region. Um, in addition to considering travel patterns during the rush hour, uh, timing for signals at 14 different school intersections were also adjusted for the school pickup and drop off time period. Next slide, please. So the next few slides are just gonna show where our signal retiming program or projects were for this uh, particular program year, starting in the South of Osceola County, where we have four projects as shown here. Uh, next slide, please. In Orange County, we have the bulk of our projects. Um, you can see the segments are, and we also had several independent intersections and school entrance um, intersections that were retimed in Orange County. And then next slide. In Seminole County, we have the six projects that were shown here that were retimed. Next slide, please. So moving on to our results, first looking at our corridor travel time results in general for the corridor segments that are retimed, uh, the goals for our maintaining agencies was generally to reduce the travel time from end to end for the corridor segments. And we found that of the 30 corridor segments that were retimed, 93% of those or 28 of the 30 corridor segments had shorter travel times after the retiming. Um, and the same 28 of 30 corridors had more reliable travel times um, 
uh, as compared to 80% before the retiming or 24 of the corridors. And when we talk about reliable travel times, that means that you can expect the travel time on that roadway segment to be the same most of the time. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on to our intersection delay results. Um, so for the independent intersections that were retimed, 15 of those 17 had less intersection delay during the peak period after the signal retiming. And at the school intersections, our focus, as I mentioned earlier, was on the delay during pickup and drop off times. And for those eight of the 14 or 57% of the intersections had reduced delay during those periods. Next slide, please. So this slide just shows a few quick statistics on the overall 2019-2020 retiming program for all of, uh, all of the signals that were retimed. Um, and for that year's program, it resulted in an annual travel time savings of well over 500,000 vehicle hours. Um, this results in a three-year benefit of more than $27 million, assuming a savings of about $18 per hour and reduced travel time. Uh, the total project cost for the retimings for this particular year is $1.3 million, and so our overall benefit cost ratio was nearly, 20, 20, nearly 22. Uh, this high BC ratio indicates that our retiming program continues to remain an effective program for Metro Plan Orlando to invest in. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide just shows some of our, our historic benefit cost ratios. Um, you can see sort of the starting in 2010, uh, where we had really high BC ratios and that started to drop off over time. And we were um, actually starting to wonder if perhaps we'd gotten sort of to the, the point where we'd gotten as efficient as we could at some of our uh, signals. Um, but I think that this shows that particularly with changing traffic patterns and depending on the, the corridors that are selected each year, there's always some room for improvement. Next up, please. Um, looking at fuel savings and emissions, um, reducing driver delay also results in redu reduced fuel usage and reducing vehicle emissions. And for the fiscal year 2019-2020 program, we had a savings of about 471,000 gallons of fuel and reduced our vehicle carbon dioxide emissions by about 4,600 tons. Next slide. And just wanted to wrap up with some discussion about um, signal timing and safety. So historically, our regular signal timing has provided the opportunity to review signal timing clearance intervals, pedestrian timing, and adjust to current best practices as needed. Um, and maintaining coordination along the corridors also reduces vehicle diversions and increases platooning, which can also benefit our road users that are crossing the main corridors and or turning onto the corridors from side streets. Um, and in recent years, there's been increased focus on how we can use signal timing to provide additional safety benefits. So some treatments like leading pedestrian intervals, which is where there's an all red to allow a pedestrian to start in the crosswalk, no right turns on red, protected left turns, and reduced cycle length can also increase safety for pedestrians, bicyclists, and drivers. And so we're working with our, our agency partners each year to think about where we can implement those type of treatments to really make this program not just about efficiency, but also about safety. Uh, next slide, please. And that's all I have for you today, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Ms. Bach. Um, Mr. Lithuswain, it looks like your hand was raised, but I'm not sure if that was from the previous item. Okay, all right. Mr. Davis Sevilla, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, other than pedestrian safety, I love talking about traffic traffic signal timing. So this is a great presentation. Thank you for the update. I have two, two questions uh, regarding the improvements for timing um, throughout the region. Does does that also include any upgrades to uh, technology for sensing uh, cars in the intersections? Do you guys feel comfortable with technology that's currently in place? Or are you continuously looking at upgrading the any outdated or ineffective technology? And then my second question is uh, yellow light timing. Uh, when you are retiming lights, are you also making a concerted effort across the region to sort of have a consistency with the length of time that that a light is yellow because sometimes you run through an intersection is like wow that yellow was really short or wow that yellow was really long uh, to sort of kind of help train our drivers or throughout our region of you know not to be you know blindsided by a, a you know by a quick yellow turn red or uh, you know maybe maybe cause you know rear end collisions if somebody panics because the light you know went from yellow to red really quickly that that type of thing Thank you. Those are really good questions. So uh, for your first question, yes, I will say that Metro Plan Orlando and also our maintaining agencies are always thinking about how we can um, keep upgrading our signal equipment to include more sensors and allow for um, emerging technologies. Uh, for the signal retiming program specifically, we don't um, 
update the sensors as part of this, but our consultants, when they're out doing their field data collection, will make note of when there's um, either failing equipment or a need to upgrade equipment um, and let, let us know and let our maintaining agency knows, agencies know that as well. And actually um, in the tip, the tip um, public meeting that we had on Monday, which if you haven't watched it yet, I suggest that you do because it was great. Um, but we talked about one project that's funded in the upcoming TIP, which is to replace 156 intersections in Orange County with new signal cabinets, which addresses the need for uh, sort of upgraded equipment. And we continue to do that throughout the region as funding becomes available. Um, and for your second question on the yellow lights, um, it's a great one. And something we have to think about for a lot of things in our region, since we're a three county region, to sort of maintain um, things so that our drivers know what to expect. You know, that's not a conversation that uh, I have had specifically with our maintaining agencies, but we have an upcoming meeting um, this summer where I will, I'll bring that up and find out sort of what the standard is for each of the counties and talk about how we can um, standardize that if it's not already. Thank, thank you. I know that was a really specific uh, example, but I just love consistency, like you said, across all of our counties because everyone's right. driving between all of our counties. So that consistency really helps. So thank you so much for checking with that. You're welcome. Awesome. All right, Dr. Stevens. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Laura, for that uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, quick question um, regarding the uh, changes in the speed um, due to the uh, retiming. Have you made any notes or was that actually part of the, uh, the program to retime? And, and let me uh, qualify that. Um, you know, people, if the uh, light is like, let's say the light cycle is longer, people's, you know, more impatient. And I'm wondering if they, you know, if their speed is notably higher as they take off because of that impatience versus whatever, do you, do you guys ever factor that in to see what the um, results are? Yes, and that's, I think that's something that is looked at during, during the field reviews, but, you know, before any, timings are implemented, our consultants are out there usually with the maintaining agencies to take a look at what driver behavior is at all of the, the signalized intersections that are being um, retimed to see where are those types of issues. And part of the reason for some of the coordination is to try and reduce some of that impatience that makes people um, behave in those manners. So yeah, it's something that's taken into account. Oh, you went mute. Oh, you're muted, Mr. Stevens, sorry. <laughs> There you go. Am I good? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. I was just curious as to uh, if that was actually being tracked or not. So thank you very much, Laura. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, Mr. O'Hanlon, you're recognized. Yeah, Laura, as COVID is now down about 90%, but people are still not going back to the office, um, traffic patterns are have been very fluid over the past year and it will be fluid probably for another nine months. How are we taking that into account with the traffic signal retiming? And does that mean we need another traffic signal retiming sometime on a shorter time frame to then reflect all of the people that are now driving again? Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. That's a fantastic question. And actually, I think a great pitch for TISMO projects in general and also sig traffic signal retiming um, because there are changes in traffic patterns throughout. We've seen a lot with the pandemic. We're still all waiting to see how um, work patterns will, will respond as we all, some of us return back to work in hybrid environments. And so there's a potential that there will be a need for um, additional signal retiming or more more quick signal retiming on um, corridors that were recently retimed. And so our maintaining agencies are sort of tracking that and we will make those decisions as it makes sense. But I think um, one of the nice things about signal retiming is you can go back and, and update as needed. And it's not you know, a capacity improvement that's sort of out there and you can't take it back. So we have that flexibility with this type of tool. Laura, this is a very popular presentation today. You're next. Excellent. So I, I just wanted to build on kind of David's question earlier and um, in regards to obsolete equipment, it's great to hear about the investment that Orange County is making, but is there anything that we can do as a region to say um, whenever equipment, obsolete equipment um, has reached its end of useful life or is being replaced that a signal timing, retiming is a mandatory part of that? It just seems like if we're going to pay for that equipment to be replaced and for it to be reprogrammed with the old timing, that would be a, a cost savings to retime it concurrently. Just 
wondering if we can get some consistency as a region and make that commitment. So our, my answer to that, our, our uh, maintaining agencies, they, they sort of select and prioritize the, the corridor segments and individual signals that they would like for us to focus on. And we're not the only retiming program. FDOT does retiming. Um, each of the, the jurisdictions do their own retiming as well. Um, and so I think that they have an eye on, on those types of issues all the time and implementing or putting in place new signal uh, cabinet uh, infrastructure doesn't necessarily mean that a corridor needs to be retimed. The, the timing may be, you know, just fine. And so generally, I think that the decision points tend to be, when was the corridor last retimed? Has there been some sort of major change in traffic pattern or land use that would cause a major change in traffic pattern? And or are they seeing issues or getting complaints about the corridor? And I think sort of those issues tend to, to be the ones that help them decide and prioritize which signals are gonna get retimed. But I think that's also taken into account as they're replacing cabinet equipment. So I think that's going on already. Ms. Bell, Ms. Cheryl Stone, you're recognized for your comments. You muted, Ms. Stone. Forgot to do that part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for that presentation. Um, I was intrigued by um, your statement about replacing equipment as, as the project goes on, and I wanted to um, ask what are the considerations for having more talking traffic signals for persons that use mobility aids or maybe um, vision impaired or blind? Uh, I know we have some in certain areas because I've been involved in that, but as we're replacing the um, with updated technology and as the timing can be tweaked here and there depending on what's going on in the world, uh, I think it's even more important to be able to to um, have access to um, audio or um, even a spontaneous lengthening of that timing so that people can get across the street as pedestrians who use mobility devices or someone who can't see. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stone, that's a great question. Um, with respect to uh, some of the devices that uh, make sort of audio sounds or, or, or visual types of um, cues, I think that those are, are really um, considered by our maintaining agencies where, where they know that there are um, high numbers of pedestrians or where they're getting requests for those sorts of things. Um, and so that's why you sort of see them at, at, at various places. And so I think if you are in an area where you think one is needed, I always encourage you to you know, make, make a comment to someone. And because I think hearing those comments from our, our residents and visitors is how they know what, where there is an issue, as well as you know, continual field reviews, there's always sort of staff out there looking to see where there may need to be upgrades. And some of that's just about making a decision about you know, where funding can go. But if, if they know that there's an issue, there, there's always you know, an impetus to try and solve it. I, I understand that, but I, but I also want to um, it, it, at least expand upon that, that instead of always waiting for someone to come um, in front of a board or somewhere and go, oh, a lot of us, quote unquote, people um, live where we need some um, audio talking traffic signals, that type of thing. We're being encouraged more and more to use public transit. So the, the, the bus stops are located at busy intersections for the most part are near them. So if we're to get to those bus stops, we have to be able to cross busy streets like you know, Highway 50, 1792, et cetera. And um, so, you know, I just wanted to throw that in there. It's not necessarily that we need those devices by retirement centers or um, for instance, CIL off of Denning, et cetera but um, we need them in the places that people need to go to access uh, transportation. So just throwing that in. I appreciate it. And I will, at the, mention, the meeting that I mentioned earlier, we'll bring that up. And you know, we're, we're, we keep pushing here at MetroPlan uh, to continually think about how we can make our, our intersections more safe. And I think that's one of the ways. So we'll, we'll keep that discussion in the mix for sure. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ms. Stone. Um, so we don't have any additional hands raised, but um, Laura, as always, I think this presentation is one of our favorites. Um, we really 
appreciate the information you bring to us. Um, I think it's definitely a CAC favorite. So, but I did have a question. I know um, with this retiming presentation, uh, cost benefit analysis is something that you guys uh, continually track and do a really great job of. Um, as more of us uh, talk, have this conversation about safety, is there any way that you could also track safety improvements that are being made as the retimings are happening, um, which jurisdictions are implementing some of those as the, like if it's necessary are, and are they implementing, or if it's recommended and are they implementing it? Um, and maybe an example of a jurisdiction that has moved forward with some safety improvements, uh, just so we know that it's happening and so get an idea of what it looks like in real life. Yes, I love that suggestion. Yes, we'll do that. Thank you. So much. Awesome. All right for our final presentation of the day. Thank you, Ms. Falk. So we're gonna, right now we're gonna get a status update on I-4 um, Beyond the Ultimate uh, from FDOT. Um, Ms. Catalina Chacon from uh, Florida Department of Transportation is with us and the floor is yours, Ms. Chacon, when you are ready. Good morning, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Catalina Chacon. I am the project manager overseeing the I-4 Beyond the Ultimate program at FDOT. Um, I'm here today to give you an update um, on I-4 Beyond the Ultimate. So our agenda, I'm going to go over the um, a brief overview on I-4 BTU. Um, we're going to talk about the I-4 Ultimate project and the Sand Lake Road um, project. We're going to provide an update on this. And then we're going to talk about um, a reimagining the I-4 BTU corridor. Um, we're going to provide um, background and kind of like the direction that we were headed, um, that we're envisioning. Uh, for I-4 BTU. We will look at the I-4 BTU South extension. We will look at the North extension, next steps, uh, quick programming update, and then we'll take some questions. Next slide, please. All righty, so a quick overview. Next slide, please. Um, some of the goals of the I-4 Beyond the Ultimate project is to increase safety, enhance mobility. Uh, we recognize that I-4 is the backbone of Central Florida. We want to increase connectivity, provide a reliable transportation system that is, that is going to support the economy of the region. Next slide, please. Um, looking at the um, the south extension or the south segment, so what you're looking on the on the left hand side is um, like a map that represents the four segments that came out of the uh, PDNE study for I-4 Beyond the Ultimate. We have segment two, which is the one that ties into the I-4 Ultimate project. And as you move to the south or west, you have segment 1B, 1A, and then segment five, ending at um, Polk County at the US-27 and I-4 interchange. Looking at the right-hand side, we have a table that shows the current status of the construction funding as well as the right away funding. Um, and as you can see, the majority of these projects are currently not funded for construction and right away. Um, the biggest thing that we have is, the biggest challenge that we face is um, the funding. How can we get this projects funded for construction? We know that we need um, improvements to I-4 um, outside the I-4 Ultimate that's near completion. And um, with with this, we're kind of this is kind of where we're coming from with this reimagining or this value engineering that we're currently in the early stages here in District Five. Next slide, please. Um, this slide just shows uh, the North project. So basically, we have segment three that starts where I for Ultimate ends or begins um, near Longwood and Seminole County, and then we also have segment four in Volusia County, all the way to um, State Road 472. The table shows the current construction and right away status for the projects and um, the picture is very similar to the south segments. We only have one project um, currently uh, tentative for funding for construction, not until the outer years and the right away um, looks very similar. Only one project funded for right away. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I'm gonna come back and tie the, the big overview later on, but let me switch gears quickly. Um, I, I'm gonna provide an update on the I for Ultimate and Sand Lake Road project. Next slide, please. So 
we what we're looking here is basically um, the, the the orange circle and the screen shows the point where the express lanes are being proposed to terminate from the IFRO ultimate project, the one that's under construction. The construction is expected to end by the end of this year, and with um, with our continued evaluation of the I-4 Beyond the Ultimate, which is the next project adjacent to this, uh, we have uh, we are we have analyzed and have identified a bottleneck um, in the in the westbound direction um, after this merge point of the express lanes. Um, so we identify potential impacts to the express lane termination point um, that we want to make sure we address. Next slide, please. So by how, you know, how do we address this? Um, we had the Sand Lake Road interchange project um, shown here on the screen that was going to um, go into construction next spring. Um, it, it only included the interchange improvements at Sand Lake Road and I-4, um, but with this anticipated bottleneck in the express lanes, we are going to um, modify the scope of this work. We're going to add um, the extension of a single lane, single express lane in the westbound direction to provide the additional capacity that's needed to I-4 in the express lanes. Um, it will be a design build project with an anticipating bid opening or letting in spring of next year, May of next year. The estimated construction cost is $208 million. And um, as part of the improvements to Sand Lake Road interchange, we're proposing to convert the existing interchange to a diverging diamond interchange as shown on the screen. We also are proposing a loop ramp um, that is going to carry the traffic that wants to go to Turkey Lake Road. Uh, we will be eliminating the, um, that will be the westbound to southbound Turkey Lake left turn. And um, this movement will be now handled by that loop, loop ramp that you can see here. This loop, loop ramp will tie in at Turkey Lake Road at the newly constructed signalized intersection just south of that um, whole Foods Plaza area. Next slide, please. Okay, so now going back to that big picture. Um, so as I showed um, at the beginning of the presentation, we show the existing um, status of all of the I-4 beyond the ultimate uh, segments. Next slide, please. And the biggest challenge that we face is, is, you know, how can we get this project funded for construction? We know that with the current I-4 ultimate project that's under construction, we have learned um, a lot of lessons from the, the size, the magnitude, and, and managing that, that type of project um, that we definitely like to take advantage of those lessons that we learn and apply them to this beyond the ultimate project. So we're doing kind of like a value engineering approach to I-4 beyond the ultimate. Um, we want to, there are new tools that we have now in our toolbox that we want to use and see if we can find any efficiencies um, while preserving the purpose and need from the original I-4 for pd &E study. So we want to relook at the typical section. Is there anything um, with those new tools that we have? And I'm going to go over those tools that we can apply to the I-4 BTU. Uh, we know that we need to add capacity to I-4. Um, there is an updated managed lanes policy that we can use. Um, we want to look at the access assumptions. So basically those um, ingress and egress points to and from the express lanes. Um, we the, the state is building more express lanes and we have more guidance and more lessons learned. So we wanna see if we can um, use those. And then finally, we also want to look at the size and the cost of the projects. Like I had mentioned, we wanna see if we can get the size smaller to actually be able to, to get the funding um, with current talks about stimulus funding from the current administration, we definitely wanna be ready um, in case we get uh, the funding. Next, next slide, please. 
So some of the opportunities that we would like to um, evaluate and, and see if we can take advantage of include the um, updated policy or guide, guidance when it comes to managed lanes. Um, so previously we had the express lane policy, which uh, basically whenever we needed to add capacity to interstate, um, it was via the express lanes. Now we have the managed lanes policy, which became effective in 2020, that gives us more flexibility on how we add um, capacity. So it could be express lanes. Express lanes is a type of managed lanes. It could be truck lanes, um, where we're going to look and see if we could just add a general use lane and see if that will provide the capacity that we need um, in our evaluation. Um, as I mentioned, we have more guidance on the direct connects and the ingress and egress points to and from the express lane. So we wanna see if we can apply those, that new guidance and lessons learned to our project. Um, we also have new parameters. Um, there's more options when it comes to the separation type um, from the, the separation type between the express lanes and the general use lanes. And then finally, like I mentioned, the industry feedback and lessons learned. We wanna see the size and cost of the project. See, we can reimagine this, um, the projects to come up with smaller size projects that when fund becomes available, um, we are ready to build, but they build eventually to this whole BTU, I for beyond the ultimate vision that we have. Next slide, please. So our evaluation approach, um, we know that there was definitely a lot of effort and, and time and resources that we spend when we were doing the I-4 pd &E study, and we want to maintain the purpose that need. The, they still remain the same. We want to stay within our right away that was already defined for the I-4 uh, pd &E study. We don't want to go outside this right away. Uh, we want to provide similar traffic operations with this new tools that we have. And in cases, if we can provide better, we will be looking at that too. We want to identify cost savings opportunities so that the department can be in a better position to move forward the projects to construction. And then as we go through this evaluation, we just have to keep in mind that we were going to have to do um, traffic reevaluations and environmental reevaluations that take time. So we just got to keep that in mind um, when funding becomes available. Um, and we also want to obviously engage the stakeholders. Um, we have been talking to our local partners about this, where we're coming from and where we're headed uh, to make sure that we receive the feedback and um, unite our visions on the I-4 beyond the ultimate corridor. Next slide, please. So looking at the south um, extension, we kind of broke it uh, down into two segments. The first segment is from 528 to US 192. And some of the key elements of our value engineering concept include uh, bringing the I-4 mainline at grade. Uh, we recognize that by removing a lot of the viaduct, we this translates into cost savings and and that is you know that's while still preserving the the, the operations from the pd &E, uh, we want to see if we can come up with cost savings we also would like to use buffer separation uh, we have more experience more research more lessons learned about uh, buffer separation as compared to barrier separation and this also translates to um, basically being able to fit I-4 at grade. Um, we want to also look at the access points and the direct connects. By bringing I-4 mainline at grade, we might have to relook at the interchange um, and see if maybe we're, we're going to have to reconfigure an interchange that is going to allow us to bring the mainline at grade. And then we also have we're trying to do like a hybrid approach where we're trying to see what was in the pd &E and if some of the elements from the pd &E are still, you know, within our vision, they, they're still valid with these new tools that we have. We also want to uh, preserve those. So, you know, we, we were proposing collector distributor systems on our pd &E and uh, and we are preserving um, one in the westbound direction. Next slide, please. Uh, click one more time because I think the two circles are going to pop. There you go. Um, so this slide shows the um, 
a typical section from the pd &E study. And so here's where I show how the, we had the elevated, we had to elevate the general use lanes. We were using better barrier separation um, on, on this concept, but we have more guidance on this. And if you click the next slide, Yep. So this is a what we envision um, a, a potential typical section might look like for the I4 beyond the ultimate. Um, we're using the uh, buffer separation. We are pre we're preserving the CD system in the westbound direction. Uh, we still have the express lanes in both directions for, for two express lanes in each direction that basically continue from I for ultimate. And then in the eastbound lanes, we have auxiliary lanes to capture that traffic um, and the eastbound lanes. We also are um, working closely and, and, and trying and, and not precluding um, some, some sort of rail envelope and with this typical within the I four right away. Next slide, please. The other segment on the south was from US 192 to US 27, and basically this this other segment will go will take us all the way to the original limits of the I4 BTU. We are currently evaluating the alternatives with those new tools that we have. We are coordinating with Brightline as well as District One and Turnpike as they have projects in the area. We want to make sure that uh, we're talking to each other to make sure we don't preclude each other from, from the projects that we have and the visions that we have in this area. Next slide. And then on the north, uh, which is the two segments, seg segments three and four, um, from 434 to 472, we are also doing the project evaluation um, using these tools that we have to see we can apply to them. We're looking at um, operational needs. So we need capacity on I-4. How do we provide this capacity that we need? We're looking at the interchange operations as well as surface street improvements and ramp terminal improvements. And as we continue our evaluation and we, with the current um, administration that talks about stimulus, we want to make sure that um, we, we keep an, our ears and eye open for available funding. Uh, we definitely want to have a phase approach on, on I-4 BTU. Like I mentioned, we want to see, instead of waiting 10 years for the, the mega project to get funded, we want to be able to identify um, smaller size projects that we can build towards BTU that potentially we can get funded um, sooner rather than later. Next slide, please. Um, some of the next steps regarding this um, value engineering or reimagining I-4 is we want to continue doing our stakeholder outreach. Um, we want to provide, um, as we continue our evaluation, we, we want to provide details as, as we get them um, and provide it to our stakeholders, get, obtain their feedback. We want to unite our visions um, and, and if we can, uh, unite our goals uh, on I-4 and those interchanges that touch each one of those municipalities. And then we will be scheduling future discussions as we continue our evaluation and, ha and have more details to share. Um, and then the, the goal is to adjust our approach and implement the, the, pan, the plan as funding becomes available. So like I mentioned, we want to see if we can come up with smaller size projects that um, build towards the, the big vision, the, the, the BTU vision that we have. Um, that's, that's still our goal. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is just a programming update. Next slide, please. Um, uh, we're looking at a programming update on the, um, basically on the south extension of I-4, we have um, the Champions Gate, the Diverging Diamond Interchange at I-4. Um, we just had the pre-construction meeting last week, so it's early, in, it's about to start construction. We anticipate the completion of construction in fall of next year. We also have the auxiliary lanes on I-4 in the eastbound and westbound direction from County Road 30, 532 to um, State Road 429, as well as the milling and resurfacing of I-4 in Polk County uh, from 
I'm sorry, from Polk County line to west of um, State Route 417. Those two projects are gonna let together and the letting is in August of this year. We also have the Daryl Carter interchange with an anticipa anticipated letting in January of 2022. And then finally, we have that Sand Lake Road project that I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, um, the design build project with an anticipated letting in May of 2022. Next slide, please. And that is the end of my presentation. So I can take any questions if you guys have any. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Cohn, for a very comprehensive presentation. Mr. O'Hanlon, I believe your hand was raised first. You're recognized. Tom, you're still muted. Okay, thank you. Very good presentation. Do we have any diverging diamond interchanges in Florida at this time? Uh, we in Florida we do. We have one in Vieira, I ninety five and Vieira Boulevard that's already open. The very first one I believe was in Sarasota. So on the west coast it was on I think it's University Boulevard, if I'm not mistaken. That that one was built a while ago. Well, the design concept seems phenomenal. How are they working? Well, they are, they increase safety because basically you get rid of the when you get off of the interstate, you want to make a left turn. Basically, you have to go across the oncoming traffic. Um, and what the DDI does, it, it removes that conflict point because you are the DDI diverges the traffic. So you, when you want to make that left turn, you're going to be already on the on the right side of the road, if you will, um, with the traffic going in the right direction. So you would not be crossing oncoming traffic. Yeah, so it, it looks like the throughput should be greatly increased and the safety doubled or tripled from what we have today. It, it, are we seeing those types of results? As far as I can tell, yes, I know that they're working greatly. Um, we definitely, it, it's a new concept to Florida um, and we have to um, be, uh, we need to make sure that we sign it well and we put enough emphasis that, you know, you're going to cross to the other, you know, the opposite side of the yeah, road. Yeah. Um, but yes, as far as I know, it's working great. And as long as we have the proper signage and, and signing and paper markings, um, they're, they're, they work great. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Hanlon. Um, Vice Chair Campbell, you are recognized for your comments. Catalina for that. That was Splendid, it really was. There's a lot of things that you're paying attention to. I heard you mention uh, a couple of times the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders you referred to? So we have been doing this presentation to the local partners, so cities, counties, um, as well as MPOs and TPOs. Um, we are in the very early stages of our evaluation with the new tools that we have. Um, we want to make sure we obtain, um, you know, we, we, we come up with early stage concepts that we will then take to the public. And we definitely want the input of the public. My, my thinking is how much attention is given to the businesses that live and operate along the corridor that's been disrupted for so long with this? I mean, we, we make them part of the, when, you know, when we do our stakeholder outreach, when we do our public engagement meetings um, with the public, we definitely, send the invites, the letters, we, we, we talk to them and let them know and we want their feedback as well. Just wondering what's been the effect on the businesses up and down the corridor. I mean, I know we got COVID in the middle of it, but what's been the effect just as an operational position up and down the corridor? Um, I mean, I could think about the, um, the access to their businesses. That, that's probably something big um, that we, we know that as part of all of the construction projects that we do at FDOT, um, we, we pay close attention and, and, and we listen to them if we're disrupting their businesses. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Pegram, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two questions. So I'll, I'll start with the first one. I know when I first moved to the region in 2012, it was when Beyond the Ultimate was uh, being let. And I just remember a lot of, from, from just being a private citizen, a lot of the, the selling of Beyond the Ultimate and, and how it was going to be built was, 
that uh, if DOT had planned to do the work in increments, in, in phases, that it would take 20 years. And so the idea was that Beyond the Ultimate was going to be public-private partnership, and we were going to do 20 years of work in seven years, and someone else was going to maintain it, and the tolls would um, pay that, that contractor back. Um, and it sounds like now that we're wrapping up Beyond the Ultimate, the future phases are not being approached that way. Um, and you know, it, it sounded like that was going to be a magic pill for the region to do public private partnership, but that seems to not be the strategy moving forward. And I'm wondering if you can illuminate as to why that is. Okay, um, so I am not as involved in the I for Ultimate, but I, I do know that um, we have learned a lot of lessons. Um, we know that um, from a um, industry point of view, the contracting industry, the ones that build the projects, um, a mega project this size, um, it's very difficult for them to basically finance. They just don't, you know, they're not equipped for that. Um, so based on our, you know, local feedback from our contracting um, industry, this is kind of like why we're relooking at I-4 to see if we can come up with smaller size projects that one, the industry can actually build and, you know, be successful at it. And, and the department also be, you know, able and, and successfully able to um, manage the project. So I, 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 I know that right now where we are today, um, FDOT um, does not envision doing any 3P projects like that anymore today. <laughs> and then, uh, thank you for that explanation um, on the lessons learned there. And I don't know if someone can pull up your presentation. I think it was like the second or third slide, there was a breakdown of the Beyond the Ultimate South phases and some of the costs associated with those sections. Slide five. And I don't know if someone can bring that up just for reference for all the members. Okay, let me go ahead and um, try to get that going. Leila. Thank you. Thanks, Leilani. Uh, but um, as she pulls that up, I know from an operational standpoint, you mentioned like do, using um, more, I'll say, innovative traffic management like diverging diamonds and kind of trying to reduce the, the width of the section by, um, okay, I'll call them flex stakes instead of hard barriers for the barrier separation. Um, could, you, could you go, uh, I think it's two slides before to the south section. Yeah, so this is, uh, of, oh, that was it. <laughs> So the, the thing of your entire presentation that stood out to me is that right-hand column for 1B with $708 million in right-of-way. And so I, I guess my question is of, of, you know, those operational things that you've looked at, I, I'm assuming the right-of-way includes buying parcels for just ponds for stormwater management. Has there been a value engineering of changing the stormwater management approach and chambering under the road because wow 700 million dollars just to buy land wow <laughs> i know i know it's, it's a... what the options are to not buy lands for ponds that generate no revenue yeah it's it's a big challenge that we have in that segment 1b is basically um between basically Osceola Parkway and 528. So that is a heavily urbanized developed area that we, this is why that right away is, is so expensive. Um, we actually have a vault proposed, not in this segment of BTU, but one on the north. And the challenge with that is the maintenance as well. Um, so it's like, but I mean, we are also open to looking at regional ponds that not only serve DOT, but they could also serve um, the locals. I know with I for Ultimate, I think they believe they, I believe they did something like that in, in Altamont Springs um, with the A first pond. So that is also something that, yes, you're correct. We are not just em emphasizing our, uh, our reimagining of I-4 to the operations and the roadway, but also the drainage to see if we can um, 
reduce that that the right away needs. Um, and and one of the things while we go through this evaluation is that we do not want to go outside. So we don't want this number to get bigger. We actually want it to get smaller if if possible. Thank you, Mr. Khan. I appreciate that. So, um, Ms. Uh, Henry, you're next. Thank you. Uh, very good presentation. I was trying to, I have two questions. I was trying to go back in my mind and remember and see if you remember, when did the I-4 Ultimate Project begin? I know that the company that I worked with because of street lighting, we were involved with a lot of the pre-planning. Um, but I just, in my mind, I can't remember, it like it's been going on forever. And uh, the second question is the beyond the ultimate project, do we have a timeline as to when that will end or do we see that more as an ongoing process, you know, to upgrade where, where need be? So I for ultimate started in uh, 20, I think the, the, when we executed the contract was back in 2013, but it might have been actual construction probably started in 2014. Okay. Um, and the timeline for I4 beyond the ultimate, it's kind of tricky to answer because of the funding status. So we we just not funded, but this is what we're doing. What we're doing, we're trying to come up with maybe like smaller size projects, like maybe we'll improve this interchange and it will relieve the the congestion at this area. But we know that by doing this, we're gonna have to, we're gonna observe congestion now in this new area. Um, so this is what we're doing, what we're doing. Um, it's kind of hard for me to answer that question just because we're not fully, we're not funded. Um, so most likely it's, it's gonna continue. <laughs> We yeah. definitely want to build it. We have, um, we need to build I-4 beyond the ultimate, but um, based on those lessons learned and, and, and what we've experienced with I-4 um, ultimate, um, we, we, we got to relook at it. Right. I understand. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Henry. And uh, Ms. Webster, you're, uh, I think, going to close this out on comments for this presentation. Um. My question relates to transit and how you're incorporating plans for the vastly needed transit system that um, for this area, how you're incorporating that into plans. Um, so continually expand I-4. Yeah, that's something that we're continuously looking into and it's part of our um, evaluation. Um, we know that um, with the, by bringing everything at grade and in that area that, that I showed, um, we, there, there's still some room on one, along one side of, of, of the road, uh, for potentially a rail. And then buses are also allowed in the express lanes that they actually don't pay the tolls. They're free. So I, I know that trucks are not allowed in the express lanes, but buses are allowed and they're, they won't be paying the tolls. Ms. Webster. That's it. <laughs> All right, thank you so much everyone for your comments. Ms. Shikun, we really appreciate your presentation. Um, I do want to know for our members that I-4 will actually, or sorry, FDOT um, plans to bring an update to us on the first phase of I-4 Ultimate um, and uh, talk about the managed lanes later this year. Um, I think I would ask if, uh, I know there's some more FDOT folks on the call, if they could talk also a little bit more about the lessons they've learned from I4 Ultimate. I think this committee would be more interested to hear about that as well. Um, so thank you, Mr. Khan. We really appreciate your presentation and your preview of um, what's to come with I4 uh, beyond the ultimate. All right, folks, um, we're gonna move forward today. Um, uh, we're gonna do general, so sorry, general information is found in tab five of your agenda packets. Um, a couple upcoming meetings of interest. Um, of course, our next CAC meeting um, is gonna be in August. We do not meet in July. So August 25th will be our first in-person meeting since 2020. It will be held at Metro Plan Orlando's offices in downtown Orlando at 250 South Orange Avenue, Suite 200. You're gonna get additional updates from Metro Plan Orlando staff. Uh, before that meeting, the next or the remainder of the CAC meetings for the year are included in your uh, agendas. 
and uh, Metro Plan Orlando Board will meet July 7th. They will be having an in-person meeting at the Metro Plan Orlando offices with board members and presenters in attendance. Of course, there will be a virtual option if you would like to um, attend or uh, if you wanna invite members of the public. We're gonna move on to member comments now. Uh, if you wanna make a comment, please use the raise hand feature and unmute yourself. Miss Mott, you are recognized for your comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hold on. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Sorry about that. Just wanted to take a moment and welcome the new member. Looking forward to working with you on the committee. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today, um, Cheryl. We really appreciate your participation and your, um, your the perspective you brought. Uh, Ms. Henry, you're recognized for your comments next. Uh, I don't have an actual comment and maybe we'll get this at a mailing, but uh, for those of us that were not involved prior to the pandemic, um, where is the building located and parking and all of that? Or maybe you'll be sending that out before well, August. Great. If I may, uh, yeah, if I may, um, I'll, I'll just tell you that we, we do have uh, some, some handy information on our website that we're, we're updating, and we will send that along with, with plenty of other information to you in advance of that August meeting with plenty of time for you to get back to me with any particular concerns. We also know we have some members who use public transit. We've got information on how to use public transit to get to our building and um, and so yeah we look forward to welcoming you there but uh, we will give you some more information before you're ready to come thank you so much mary ann all right um i believe mr pigram your hand was raised first and then miss stone will take you next thank you madam chair uh just following up on a question from a couple months ago i know that sunreal received about 5.6 million dollars in federal funding for safety and efficiency improvements to the corridor um, in the city of kissimmee and i don't believe i've seen that come up in a tip amendment for when that's going to be used in the next five years um, so when we get money for safety and efficiency things uh, I, I figured it would be important but i, I don't think i've seen that timeline presented to us. So just wanted to follow up on when we can expect that work to be done. That is a great point, Jeff. Um, I'm just going to ask Metro Plan Orlando staff to follow up on that. And if we could get an update either via email or at our next meeting, that'd be wonderful. Um, and may I add something? <clears throat> Of course, Nick, I was waiting for you to pop in. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for the question. Um, so typically, we only see uh, TIP amendments under current year. So if it was programmed in there and anything besides this current year, we'll see that in the next TIP. But we are starting to work with the department to uh, get that information out to um, the committees and board earlier than just seeing it once a year for the TIP for those outer years. So thanks for the question. And we will try to follow up on that. Thanks, Mr. Lepp. Ms. Stone, you're recognized. Um, hi. As someone who has spent a lot of time at Metroplan Orlando's new location, which isn't so new anymore, I would encourage those members that aren't familiar with the parking adventures with the uh, location to do a dry run before the day of the meeting. Um, the staff will send you a lot of information, which is very good on which side of the parking area to park, where to go, et cetera, but it can be an adventure, like I said. So, and consider the bus, consider the train, um, you know, those are alternatives, but I would really encourage you to do a dry run before the day of the meeting. That's all. Great advice, Ms. Stone. Thank you so much. All right, I don't see any additional hands raised. So we're gonna move forward to member comments. If any members of the public wish to comment, please use the raise hands function and you will be recognized or dial star nine on your phone keypad. We'll unmute your microphone after you recognize. Please state your name and address for the record. Please limit your comments to less than two minutes. Are there any comments at this time? Um, yes, Madam, Madam Chairwoman, we do have one comment. Um, Hannah Gutner, um, I think uh, Leilani will um, 
unmute you now and you should be able to speak when you see that prompt. Hi, Hannah. Okay, you should be able to speak now. Good? Yes. Thank you. I feel like it's telephone tag with the unmute button. Yeah, it keeps it keeps saying I'm muted, unmuted. Okay, did you hear my address? We okay. did. We just heard okay. it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's 807 Shine Ave, Orlando. And um, I'm just here as an interested member of the public. And so I have a question for Nick and for Catalina. If she's still on, I'll do Nick's question first. Um, I had the same question as Jeff about SunRail, if there's a timeline for phase three and how you guys are working with Brightline. I know they presented an update at yesterday's BCC that they are laying rail tracks that can be used up by SunRail. I wanted to ask if you guys are working together on that at all or if there's any update. Uh, we currently don't have any update besides what you've uh, heard at the Board of County Commissioner meeting yesterday. Uh, they're still working towards alignment and deciding where that's going to go, but it's still a priority for us to have the connection between the airport and SunRail. Um, so we're waiting to see how the ultimate project goes to see where that connection will fit into our overall regional vision for connecting SunRail to the airport. Okay, awesome. And uh, so is there any um, general timeline? I think they mentioned that the alignments should be, they have a study done of the alignments that should be figured out by, I think they maybe even said next Wednesday. Um, so is that like a quick turnaround? Is that just them because they're a private company and they're trying to kind of move it along or? Well, uh, the alignment is one component. Um, so that, that will kind of set the where the tracks and everything will go. The bigger component that we're still wrestling with is the region is funding it. So yeah. the funding of the operations of SunRail Phase 3, and especially as SunRail is going through the transition talk between the department and the local governments, right now that's, that's the priority in that transition. And then we still need to find those operating funds to fund Phase 3. Of course. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, and then I have a question for Catalina if she's still on. It's totally okay if she's not. Okay, that's fine. I will just let yeah, that go. I, mean, I encourage you to send an email to Metro Plan Orlando staff um, and they can relay it potentially to our partners over at FDOT um, for a follow up. Uh, I think as committee members, we might also be interested in hearing what your question is, um, okay. finding out um, what the answer might be from FDOT. But we really appreciate your participation. Um, public comment is always welcome. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys. It was a good meeting. All right. Uh, excuse me, chair, Chairwoman. Yes, for Kenya. Hey, I was just going to um, ask Ms. Gutner if she could go ahead and propose the question. I'm here from FDOT. I don't know that I would have the answer for her, but I could definitely take that information back to office internally. Sure. Um, sorry, Metro Plan Orlando staff, if you can unmute Hannah so she can uh, share her question, and I don't know if she has. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, so the question um, just maybe has like one or two layers. So I just wanted to ask because Catalina said you're not precluding a rail envelope in the right of way for the Beyond the Ultimate project, I believe. Um, and Jeff mentioned that it was $708 million for that right of way. I just wanted to ask if I4 or FDOT or anybody is working with the other stakeholders like Brightline or Lynx that could benefit from the purchase of the right of way. And I also wanted to ask if um, if FDOT or anybody is considering giving a lane on I-4 solely to BRT as opposed to just letting them go through the express lanes for free, because I can imagine drivers still getting frustrated um, and kind of speeding around buses in the express lanes and things like that. Okay, just for clarification, I'm sorry, Chairwoman, this is Rakenia. Yeah, go ahead, Rakenia. <laughs> um, I just wanna make sure I'm, understanding for clarification purposes. Um, the latter question was um, considering a lane, a BRT lane for freight specifically 
on I-4, correct? Not for freight, for, for public transit. Oh. Mm -hmm. All righty, and that other, the beginning question was re in regards to the rail envelope, um, mm -hmm. if any other state, <clears throat> excuse me, stakeholders were <clears throat> considered and part of that um, acquisition as well, correct? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Gutner. Thanks, uh, Ms. Hinson. All right, I think that concludes that portion of public comment. Marianne, can you um, let us know if there were any written comments submitted? We did not have any uh, written or telephone message comments, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Awesome. All right, folks, to the right now concludes our June meeting. Uh, if there is no further business, we stand adjourned. Thank you so much for participating today and see you in person August 25th. Bye, everybody. Great meeting, Madam Chairwoman. Well, Great meeting. We'll really see you. We'll really see you. <laughs>